Oh, thank you. I'm honored and completely overwhelmed to be here today. Um, about two years ago, you know, I was just sitting in my living room playing with my kids. I was a stay-at-home father for several years and enjoying a simple life, the life I always wanted, just a simple existence. And turns out that's not what the universe had planned for me. So here I am after a little project I started to make my son healthier, took on a life of its own. So make it better. I remember Evan asking me this one evening while he laid in bed. And I said, buddy, if I, if I can, I will. So this is, this is our story of how sometimes you can, in fact, make it better. So this is Evan. And two years ago, almost to this day, his life, his mother's, his sister's, and my own, completely changed. He was showing signs. Uh, he was thirsty all the time, peeing a lot for a couple weeks. So my wife and I decided, you know, this, this is no good. We need to get him to a doctor. We brought them, brought them, just brought him into our primary care, and they recognized the symptoms of type 1 diabetes immediately. Did a urine test, a finger check, and sent Laura and Evan up to the emergency room where, where I met them. So here was Evan, and obviously none too happy. <laughs> so the diagnosis was certainly confirmed when we got there with a blood sugar of just over 530 milligrams per deciliter, which turns out is actually pretty good for you know catching an onset of type 1. He didn't have any ketones, so he did not need to spend time in the ICU. S you know, small blessings at this point, right? But as we stood there getting this news, you just, you feel the ground either evaporate or just fall away from you. You realize that life has just completely changed, that nothing you thought your life was gonna be, your son's life was gonna be, your daughter, your wife, that life was gone. And at the same time, I, you know, I didn't know much about type one. My mother was a school nurse, so I would hear stories from her, you know, about some of the type one students whose parents wouldn't give them insulin on the weekend, so she'd have to chase it down and get them, you know, she'd get them regulated during the week. So these early challenges, this very sort of tangent of insight scared me. And as it was explained to me, you know, I just had even more anxiety. Because type one is misunderstood, it turns out. And it's not caused by diet or lifestyle. And most of you may know this, but I have to say it because it's not uncommon for someone to ask me, when will Evan outgrow this? If he ate differently, if he exercised more, would it go away? And that's not the case. Evan's immune system has gone haywire. It attacks the beta cells in his pancreas and he can't make insulin anymore, or not enough to keep the blood sugar from running rampant in his system. So without the insulin, blood glucose or blood sugar skyrockets, just as it did at his onset. It doesn't give your body any choice but, but to siphon the fluids out in what is only a doomed attempt to try to, try to purge that sugar. And I often reflect that less than 100 years ago, if you had type 1 diabetes, it was going to kill you. And as we learned from these wonderful nurses here, what type 1 management was like, these early learnings, became very clear that it wasn't a simple task. And at the same time, they give you this drug, they give you this insulin, this potentially lethal, dangerous drug, and say, give this to your son, um, maybe he needs this much. We don't really know what, do what the dose is. We'll, we'll have to figure it out. So here you go. You'll need to adjust it based on how much 
carbs are in his food, the fat intake, fiber, protein? Oh, is he stressed out? Because that may make him go high, it may make his, it may make his blood sugar skyrocket, or it may make it tank. And if he's sick, same thing. And one illness will make him go high, the other will make him go low, because it's impacting his ability to absorb the food he's eating. And exercise and activity. He was four. He'd run around and play very erratically. So again, depending on what muscle groups he was using in that exercise, would impact the amount of insulin he needed. And we didn't really have this insight until we did, you know, a simple finger check. He would, you know, was he too low, was he too high? And then we'd correct and then recheck. So it was this sort of flying blind at this point. And interesting statistic that I'd heard once was the estimation that at the end of the day, a person with type 1 has completed about 600 diabetes-related tasks. And that's in a single day. So that, you know, having lived with it now for two years with my son, that seems like a fair assessment, a pretty good estimate. So what diabetes did to us? And actually, I should go back here. Let's see. That cliff's edge there is an important thing. Because diabetes forces you to walk it. If you go in one direction, there's a desert. That's your high blood sugar. It's going to burn you for life and eventually take it from you if you hang out there too long. The other side is that precipice, that cliff. If you fall, it's going to take you quick. So maybe, maybe you have three, four feet of safe walking space. And maybe there are a few vines that you can pull yourself back up with should you fall. But the wind will gust in either direction, randomly. Oh, and you need to keep walking even when you're asleep. You need to keep that line going. So that was our new normal, walking this cliffside. So after three days, they send you home with this feeling of, you lost. You know, they've taught you how to give injections. They've taught you how to do finger checks. But they don't teach you how to integrate it back into your life. They don't teach you how to be happy with it. None of that happens. And then you realize you have a four-year-old son that simply can't walk the cliff alone. And we would help him. And we'd have to find a way. So we had the basic training but we were still pretty devastated just by the emotional weight of the diagnosis. So we, lo we were looking for hope. Unfortunately, there are many amazing people out there. One of them is a local family. Um, I'm from upstate New York, Livonia, New York, near Rochester. And this amazing family, the Mayos, heard about Evan's diagnosis and gave us a call and said, our eldest son was diagnosed type 1 when he was 7 years old. We'd love to show you what we do, how our lives are now after 6 years. He was 13 at the time, 12, 13. So they invited us over and showed us their methods, how they managed it. But what struck us was how normal their lives were. The great vacations they would take, the other five children being well cared for and not neglected and it was just it was it was a happy place so when we left my wife and I kind of looked at each other and said is this the future is this can we can we have this someday so there was there was that 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 glimmer of hope that we were looking for and again others reached out another friend of mine from high school Andrea her son had been diagnosed at age four, three or four as well. Her similar experience, she shared that with us and offered her help. And we also began to raise money for diabetes charities. So I sent an email out to a bunch of my 
LinkedIn connections. And I received a letter back from uh, an old colleague, Sean, who mentioned another colleague, Ken, who I used to work with. His son had been diagnosed when he was young with type 1. So I got in touch with Ken, who is actually here today. And he recommended Gary Shiner's book, Think Like a Pancreas. So what was that? Think, like a Think Like a Pancreas. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> so I immediately went out and got it. And to me, this book was a revelation to me because it was, it was the do-it-yourself guide to managing diabetes that, that I needed. It really explained things in great terms that I, as an engineer, could collect this data and follow this path and take control of Evan's management. And for the first time since diagnosis, I, I felt a little better. You know, I felt some healing had begun, and I felt that I could do better. And Ken and all these amazing people had helped us just by virtue. They, they had been there. They knew what those first months, year of upheaval were, was like, and they were, they were happy to help. So as we began to do it ourselves, we found that it was much harder than it had to be. We collected a lot of data, and Laura and I are both engineers, so we thrive on data by collecting it, analyzing it. My background as a systems engineer was particularly handy at the time. So pulling data together, making sense of it, integrating systems together, understanding their interactions, this could all be useful. And diabetes management spews data. Most of it just gets tossed aside once we use it. Oh, that meal was 30 grams of carbs. You know, we gave him one unit of insulin. Okay, okay, good. And then you move on to the next one. But what if we could pull all this data together in one place and then use this data to drive the decisions we make to manage Evan's diabetes? And we thought, yeah, someone else has done this. This system exists, right? Surely. This makes perfect sense, right? It doesn't have to be this hard. Well, we didn't find what we were looking for. There's some very, very cool apps out there. Um, a few of my favorites being, you know, the Gluco app, MySugar. Very cool and very promising. But do I have to wait for the true functionality that I want? So the larger companies, they have their ecosystems, they have their devices and their software and their back ends that they want you tied to. But some of that software and even the hardware themselves seems antiquated, it's clunky, and not very useful. So maybe we could just whip something together ourselves that, that could do exactly what we wanted. So starting mostly from scratch, the first thing we did, and we had this probably a couple weeks after Evan went back to daycare, was just a simple Google form where the nurse at daycare could log finger checks and tell us why she was finger checking. So those, that information we had sent to us in an SMS, a text message, or an email, and my wife and I could respond or call the nurse if there was any, any issue, anything else we had to address. We could also build a process for the nurse to follow, give her you know, very clear instructions what to do should a blood sugar measure X, Y, and Z at this time of day. We created a detailed meal sheet tracking the carb factors for each of the food and the total carb count. We've since modified this to, to take a look at glycemic load of a meal, but this was another piece of information that we could collect. And we used Glucose tool and their app to interface his standard finger check blood glucose meter, integrate that data into their app so we could take a look at how he was doing. And we used that to sort of track his average blood sugars and all that, all that fun stuff. Then we found the Dexcom G4. 
the Dexcom G4 is a continuous glucose monitor. It's a device, a sensor, a wire that cur currently Evan, I always grab right here <laughs> when I describe it because that's where Evan wears it. So currently it's a, an amazing device. So every five minutes it sends us, or it sends a receiver I should say, transmits a blood glucose value that they interpret that they, based on calibration data, you give it. So soon after Evan's diagnosis, I set up various Google News Alerts, you know, for the obvious ones, type 1 cure, artificial pancreas, all that good stuff. And around October, November 2012, a few links started to pop up for the Dexcom G4. It was a new device just approved by the FDA, you know, the next generation continuous glucose monitor sensor. So I was excited. It was more accurate than the competing product and we'd have a steady stream of data that we could use to keep Evan healthier. Because it was very common with just some simple finger checks to get to meal time and have him be way too high to eat, you know, blood sugar of 250. So you do the correction, and you don't want him to eat right away. So you, you wait. You fight with him a little bit because he's hungry. So it became this trade-off of, okay, should I let him peak, you know, spike to 400 so he can eat now or just let him be sad? And it wasn't a compromise we cared to make, but it was a common one. So now, switching to a CGM, Just using a blood glucose meter now in hindsight is, is like driving without headlights. Maybe, maybe, maybe you reach out with a flashlight once in a while and turn it on, and that's all you got. So the CGM, well maybe not headlights, maybe fog lights is what they are. It's still better than what we had. So it took a bit of work with the insurance company, but we finally did get a hold of it in February 2013. So our evenings went from getting up three to four times. We'd set alarms on our phones to hop out of bed to do finger checks to, you know, just waiting for the alerts on the CGM to wake us up. And we would have nights where we actually slept through again. It was amazing. <laughs> and so simple things that you, that you quickly come to appreciate when this diabetes enters your life, when this disease enters your life. So, we immediately loved the CGM. And my first tweets were about this. And this excitement, I said, okay, I'm gonna use my Twitter account to tweet about our, di our diabetes life, our T1D life. From there, I had this notion that I didn't want to be separated from this data. So we used it for the first weekend, and when I dropped him off at daycare, I was filled with anxiety. I, all of a sudden, I was blind again. Okay, the teachers had it, but I wanted to see it too. So my initial thought was very simple. If I can hook that monitor up to a laptop, stick it in daycare, I can just remote into it, just remote desktop, launch Dexcom's application and pull up that data as I needed it. But with a little bit of luck, I was looking through the files on the computer and I saw this receiver commercial API DLL. So other software engineers will recognize what that is. That's the key to the castle essentially. That file would allow me to pull data with my own applications off of that receiver. So we built a very simple, you know, we were limited to, limited to a Windows PC at this point, very simple app that sent that data up to a Google spreadsheet. My wife and I could open that Google spreadsheet and we could view it. So then I created just a simple website, you can kind of see it in, in the picture there where the nurse, my wife and I, we could see that data. So this was our, our first pass at 
remote monitoring, and it, it came about pretty quickly, probably driven mostly by my own anxiety. So the next goal was to make it easier to glance. So sitting in a spreadsheet, it's not very easy to kind of, you know, glance at it and figure it out. So I created a very simple iOS application that showed his current number in the trend and would use the badge. There's Superman I have in there. Would use the badge to show us his current blood glucose. So it was a good start, but it wasn't really ambulatory. So there were huge gaps during the day. Played outside a lot. They went for walks around the ponds, and we couldn't see him. And those are arguably the more dangerous times. You know, when, if he's going to go low, those were probably about when it was going to happen. So the thought occurred to me that, you know, if, if this Windows PC can do it, there's got to be a smartphone that can do it. So I be began looking into smartphone as an uploader. And Android was the only really, it was the only choice. Apple wanted additional licensing fee to use their USB as a host. And Windows Mobile didn't, didn't allow any hosting at the time. So you couldn't, you couldn't talk to a USB device from a, from a Windows machine. So hacking. So this is where my life began as a so-called hacker. I'm not sure it qualifies as real hacking because all I did was recreate what they are already doing. I didn't have to change their device in any way. I just needed to recreate in Java the same command structure that they were using in their Windows C Sharp code. So, Using the Windows library and just a simple program to trigger those actual commands, you can actually capture the bits that are flowing across. And with a little bit of luck, you can decode those commands. And more importantly, you can decode the data that they coax out of the G4 receiver. So I can spare you most of the details because they're very exciting. But <laughs> <laughs> So this note page here is probably the most important one. I had, this was decoding what Dexcom calls the estimated glucose value page. So this, this was the data I was looking for, and this was the structure of the data, and how I was to, able to map it back and use it in my Android application. So then there was the moment that it happened, it worked. I got the number. And that was the start. And I was very excited, and the reason's right there in the tweet. Kindergarten was coming, and my goal was to keep Evan safer than, than I, up until that moment was possible. Of course, you know, like the excitement doesn't last very long when you realize that all the real work comes after. <laughs> so we needed to make an app that didn't crash, and uh, did I just snap the USB port on the G4? So G4 has a particular weakness in the USB port. It's very delicate. And if you, if you use it enough, it will, it will most certainly break. So, so we needed to find a way to keep it secure, to keep any force off of that, undue force off of that port. Also, without it becoming an unnecessary burden to a five-year-old. He's a little boy going to kindergarten. We don't want to yeah. saddle him with a huge box of stuff. I mean, he's going to have a kit with emergency supplies and his testing equipment, all that good stuff. But it wasn't an option if it, if it made his life worse. So repurposing a common fly fishing box, drilling a couple holes in it. We had a nice little four by six case to hold his phone and CGM, and that fit nicely into his bag without any undue burden to him. We also knew that, that seeing the blood glucose values was only part of the puzzle. The accuracy of the treatment and timely care is critical. So 
that original care portal that we built for daycare morphed into something more, more robust for kindergarten. So you can kind of see it there, but we, we began to track the amount of insulin he was given at school and when, and the carbs in his lunch, which I would make before the day and send him with a meal card. And so that data, along with his CGM data, was going into the same cloud source, the same database. And so now we can mine that combined data to find ways to improve Evan's blood glucose control. You, we can fine tune the methods and the amount of insulin Evan needs at any given time of day for a wide range of foods. And, and even for his basal, that sort of all day insulin that he needs, that can be very tricky. So with this combined data, we're able to do that. The next sort of great thing we, we got was this Pebble Watch. And it was important because I've heard the term career cycle used to describe type 1 parents because we become obviously more focused on our child's health and well-being than our own careers. And more than one occasion, you know, I could see the insult on someone's face when I would pull my phone out and check a blood glucose. So this was an obvious solution to that problem, you know, just a very quick glance, you know, right now, my son in Rochester, he's 87 and flat, which is great. So, so now I can just peek yeah, yeah, as I need to, but I, I will say this, there, were t there are times where someone's talking and you check and they, you have to explain, no, 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 <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not rushing you. <laughs> and there's a story, another gentleman, I believe he's in the Navy, was talking to an admiral and did the same. Same thing, checked his son's blood glucose with the pebble and had to explain that <laughs> away. But that, that's a little easier to explain. So this became a very useful, I mean, it was far less obtrusive and has great battery life. The display, I can read it inside and out and it has an SDK, a software development kit that anyone that wants to create an app for it and is so inclined can, and I certainly was in this case. Did I skip one? No, okay. So all this tweeting. I was tweeting when I was up to, even though it made me a little nervous, because I had the sense that, you know, again, you're not supposed to monkey with your medical devices. You're not supposed to do these sorts of things. It's not approved, you're, you know, it's risky, et cetera, et cetera. But I put it out there anyway, Laura and I, we both knew it was worth sharing. It had been such a blessing to us, life-changing, as much as the CGM, if not more so. So why hide it? So Lane Desborough was the first individual that reached out to me after seeing, seeing an, a tweet about the Android app. And he wanted to keep an eye on his son, Hayden, overnight. Dexcom receiver would not reach. If they had one in his in, in, in their room, it wouldn't reach, did not have the, the range to Hayden's room. So they wanted this remote system so they could watch it all night. So he built Night Scout. And I was happy to share my uploader code to get them started. And what's nice, you have this collaboration. The chart code that I use now is theirs was code that Lane and Ross wrote. And very generous of them to give it because it, it gives that retrospective view and it gives us a, a great look at the day. And before, I just had a single number that I was staring at. And honestly, without Lane, I wouldn't be standing here at all. Most of my life spent probably doubting myself, filled with doubt, and essentially, you know, never thinking anything I did was worthwhile. You know, a challenging childhood can do that to a person. But here was this guy, brilliant man, kind. He encouraged me. He assured me what I was doing was important, and I decided to trust him. So with the support, I put those doubts aside, and I continue to fight them, but I, I do push them aside. 
and my goal to help not only Evan, but others. So a few other folks that I met through Twitter, Dana Lewis, Scott Liebrin, Toby Canning, Jason Calabrese, and Jason Adams. They became my Twitter friends and continued to motivate me to share, even as a rough set of code, that Android uploader. Whether to help their own children or build a do-it-yourself pancreas system. These were wonderful people that deserved to use this app. None of us wanted to wait. And I didn't want to make them wait anymore. Howard Look, he's the CEO of an amazing nonprofit, Tidepool. He gave an impassioned speech at the Diabetes Mind Innovation Summit last November. And the phrase, we are not waiting, that tag was born. And to list just a few of the things we're not waiting for and the things that grabbed us and what we try to tell the device makers and the medical professionals is that we're not going to wait. We want the peace of mind that our child with diabetes is safe. We want to give our child a better chance to su succeed at school. We want to get some decent sleep. <laughs> and we're not going to wait for competitors to cooperate, for regular, regula regulators to regulate, for the device manufacturers to innovate. And we're not going to wait to stop guessing, to be happier and healthier, and to simply exceed all expectation. So Jason Adams, in particular, is a brave man, created the CGM in the Cloud Facebook group about four months ago. So this was just the other day. I posted, this, I posted an option for people to put markers on a map say, if you're using Night Scout, if you're in the CGM in the Cloud group, tag your location. So as of two days ago when I pulled this map, 200 of the 4,500 members of that group had posted. So you can see we got, we've made it around the world pretty well. And we knew these tools were wonderful, but beyond any expectation I ever had for how needed this type of system was. Well, it, it, it still leaves me essentially speechless to see how it's grown. Because there's that point where I knew it was a great thing. I knew it was awesome. I, knew, I saw what it did for our lives. But without commercializing it, I didn't think it would ever scale. And for me, commercialization was never an option because I would rather help 20, 30 families now than hold it up in regulatory or some other process for the next three years and then just get beaten to market by Dexcom, which has every intent of creating a similar product, right? So there's strength in numbers. Group membership is currently on it. It's trending. It doubles monthly. And people do learn how to put the system together themselves, they make it better in their own way. From which phones to use and which phone services are cheapest, from the cables and the cases to store and transport and keep it safe, to completely new code bases that are awesome and amazing, and refinement of the original apps that we created. And there's no shortage of people willing to help. For me, this is another source of great hope. You have this community people that have limited or almost no technical prowess at all, creating Azure websites and opening Mongo Lab accounts and buying <coughs> USB cables and Android phones and compiling code. And with each other's help, they're able to make it through these processes. And then through those learnings, improve the documentation that's there. So. The community effort can't be underestimated because it's now what was once probably, you know, several hours of work to get running and it didn't run all that well maybe is now, for most folks, it's about a 30-minute process once they have the hardware and continues, continues to improve. And it is indeed life-changing. So these are probably 
challenging to read up there. But here are six of what appears to be thousands of testimonials and tales of what Night Scout and CGM and the Cloud Group has done to change people's lives. And to see this and to think it started with just a simple app that I made sitting in my grandpa's chair. Again, it's one of those speechless, maybe surreal things. And it's just amazing. So what do these core tools? What did we make? We made a tool that gives kids freedom to go on sleepovers, for parents to go out on dates, to take things back that type one takes. We've taken back a lot. And the term taking back is a, is a good quick summary of what we set out to do in the first place. When that floor fell out from under us, all we wanted to do was rebuild it. Diabetes took away the life we knew, and every little thing we get back is just a battle. It's a battle we've won. And diabetes, for us, it is a war. And it reminds me of something that Lane Desborough once said, that diabetes is the enemy, and I will not rest until it is destroyed. And for my part, I will fight for every last speck of ground we can take back before then. And I will continue to share whatever weapons, whatever tools I find, because I know someone else may need them. And the best part, they will probably make them better. And I still feel like this is, just, this is just the beginning. What else can we do? Do you want to make your own CGM receiver? You don't like the G4? You can get a $20 little RF controller, a little wireless receiver. And this, I think I paid $30 for this Android phone. Write a simple app or use the simple app that somebody else wrote. And there's your G4 receiver. You can build your own calibration algorithms if you're inclined. Improve the algorithms that are on the G4. Get better results. Or you can make your own iOS and Android apps to interface with, with the data that you're storing in the cloud. You can make a better version of the Pebble Watch app. Or build a control system that helps you manage you and your child's diabetes. Or simply build a better case. Or build custom cables for people. Or write a better instruction manual. All these things continue to happen. And all of us in this group, we can't help but feel that we are the front lines in the fight. And we can't wait for others to give us the tools the weapons we need to survive, to help our children thrive. And we can make the new tools by simply combining or using existing resources into something that meets a real and immediate need. So whatever it is you make, I hope you share it. It may be, as I've learned, far more important than you think. Thank you.